Oh, my beloveds. I'm always astounded at the presence and the hand and the working of God. Could you use the microphone, please? Yes. Thank you. I was contemplating, so I received this energy for contemplation and not speaking out. <laughs> I'm always amazed at the how the coincidences, God's coincidences. What Raleigh had to say about what Reverend Carlos said about an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude that will get you through anything. An attitude of gratitude is an attitude of praise. When you are grateful, you are inadvertently, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, praising the Most High God. And so you are in a high vibration. And that is a protective shield, as I was talking about, the vibration of music being protective. So an attitude of praise will get you through anything. I have been deeply, deeply contemplative, and I would say concerned in a good way, in a good way, about my message in this new decade to you. It's been very highlighted. It's a new decade, and what are we bringing into this decade? That's been my personal concern. What am I carrying from the past into this new decade? And it's been, I think what spirit, the arrow that spirit has been directing me in. What are you carrying? What are you releasing? Are you truly free? Because as we embark the metaphor of a new beginning, that's not you or me carrying all my old junk in a big truck for the next 10 years. And so if we really believe the metaphors that we say, new year, new you, new decade, are we truly willing to do the work? And what are we carrying with ourselves? What are we taking? And many of us underneath the foundation in our basements are carrying betrayal, regret, fear, doubt, and worry. And shame. And shame. And blame. Oh yeah, you can call them out. And so we can don a new dress, and we can get our hair done, or we can talk the language, speak the language of newness. And yet, we know in the back, in that little small voice back there, we know we haven't let stuff go. So my talk today is triumph, triumph over betrayal. Triumph over betrayal. And I thought to myself, <clears throat> The first go-to, we know that as New Thought students, um, right now, I'm blessed, there's no coincidence to be taking a uh, course uh, as I begin part-time my ministerial studies, the Metaphysical Bible. And so, as Unity and New Thought students, Truth students, we believe that the Bible is interpreted metaphysically that it is the allegory of our soul's journey to awakening. Every single person in that Bible is a reflection of an aspect of ego mind or divine mind, mind. And the battles and the challenges are ourselves, our soul, being challenged to wake up to its divinity. 
So we don't take the Bible literally, but symbolically, metaphysically, and spiritually. And so when we think of betrayal, it's so easy to go to, if you have been raised in a Judeo-Christian background, with a Judeo-Christian background, to go to Judas. And when I was looking up betrayal, Judas came up. And I thought, well, mm, I don't know, Spirit. And Spirit was like, no, that's not the that's not the person to focus on. And we will focus on the Judas kiss during Passover and Easter. But Spirit was like, no. And I thought, oh gosh, so who in the Bible became who in the Bible overcame betrayals? And because I don't have a traditional Christian background, the, the scriptures weren't coming to me. But what was so beautiful is during the week, I would hear Joseph. So Joseph, Mary's, Mary's husband, Joseph. I would just, I'd be like washing the dishes and I would hear Joseph. And I thought, okay, Joseph of the coat of many colors. Joseph overcame many betrayals. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was betrayed many times. And so I was astonished. And I found myself giving praise just at the magic and mystery of intuition and divine guidance. I couldn't make it up. I was stunned at what I was offered. So my prayer in this moment is that there is so much, there is so much to this story. I know that the one power and the one presence is working in and through me as a humble servant, and that I am able to speak the word of God for myself and all others that are present and that may live stream this service in the future. I humble myself. And I begin. <sighs> Triumphed over betrayal. And so, okay, I have so, so many notes. But let me begin with, let me begin. Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. And he was considered, he was the youngest son. Jacob and Rachel would bear Joseph in their older years. And because of that, Jacob considered him special, very, very special, because he was the child of his older years. And so he had a tendency to spoil Joseph. So Joseph was very, very spoiled. What is fascinating about this story, the story of Joseph, and where it is in the Bible, is that it is in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. It is chapter 37. So, Spirit, Spirit <laughs> is letting us know that one of the biggest challenges that we will face in life is betrayal. At the beginning of the Bible, this is one of the first major stories of the patriarchs of the Bible, of the fathers of the Bible. This story of betrayal. So Joseph is the 11th son, and numerologically, 11 is a master number. 11 stands for, what's interesting is Obama was an 11 master number, just to put that out there. It means that you have charisma, leadership, and intuition. You also have imagination. You are able to vision, vision and see. And there's someone here in the back that's a master, master number 11. And so the call on your life is to be connected to the Most High God. You must be in connection with the Most High God, and Joseph was. And his father, because of his love for Joseph, created or had a coat of many colors made. The colors of the coat represents the chakras, that's one interpretation. 
but it also represents infinite possibilities. The infinite possibilities of imagination that God can create everything for us if we will align our minds and our hearts and anchor ourselves in God. And so he wore this coat of many colors and his brothers saw the love that his father had for him and they were deeply jealous. They weren't just jealous, they wanted to kill him. So in Genesis 37, at the beginning here, and it's amazing to me, it felt so important to speak about betrayal because we bring all of those hurts into this new beginning, this new future, this new now, for that matter. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending to flocks with his brothers. And he brought their father, I'm so sorry, what am I? Yes, a bad report. Ah, now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had, he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornated robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So they hated him. And as they watched their father's love for Joseph, Joseph was blessed with an intuitive ability to, to dream, imagination. So Joseph means to increase. Joseph's name means Jehovah will increase. So as we think about ourselves, if we anchor ourselves in an intuitive connection with the Most High, with our unlimited thinking, our imagination, God will increase. So Joseph is each one of us when we commit to the love, the presence, the connection to God, the fearless faith of God. So in the midst of all of this jealousy, um, the brothers are out in the fields herding, and the father, his father Jacob, says to Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers. And so apparently there was quite a distance, and Joseph became lost along the way and became directed by a herdsman who said, well, I think they're over there. And as they saw Joseph approaching in the distance, they said to themselves, we hate him so much, let's kill him. So they decided that they would murder Joseph. And one of the brothers said, no, no, let's not stain our hands with blood. Um, let's just maybe sell him to the caravans of Arabs, traders that are going from Gilead to Egypt. Let's just get rid of him. We don't want to taint our hands with blood, but let's tell our father that he's dead. So they stripped him of his coat, of his imagination, of his faith, of his intuition in that moment, and they threw him in a cistern, and they ate. So he was in this well, this cistern, and they ate. And in the metaphysical Bible, it says that they were eating of the negative thoughts that they had embodied. Just like this last statement in our truth principles, you must become this truth. They had become one with their thoughts of hatred and envy. They were eating of the negative fruits. And a lot of times in betrayal, people don't care what they're doing to us. They will eat and feast and not care about the hurt. And so the Bible in the first book of Genesis talks about how when people harm us, they won't care. They might sing and dance on your grave or your, or your discord or your destruction. 
I want to make it very clear here that betrayal isn't always something that is done by another to us. We can betray ourselves. We can betray others. Our, we can feel like our bodies have betrayed us through an illness. We can feel like that employer has betrayed us through being let go or fired. We can feel as though the nation has betrayed us, this president or what have you. So we can be the betrayer or the betrayee or the betrayed. So this is not about pointing fingers, but this is about releasing an energy that can be deeply destructive to our soul that can keep us from manifesting the good that God has for us. Joseph's name means God, Jehovah, will increase. If we have a fearless faith and we belong to God and we anchor ourselves in who we are and whose we are, we will be increased. More good, more bounty, more peace, more joy, new love, new strength, new vitality, new health, restoration, life, life, and more life. So as I contemplated betrayal, I have to be so, so honest, I wasn't sure that I wanted to, to give this talk because I thought it's such a downer. <laughs> New thought is about upliftment and optimism and positivity, and I thought I'm bringing a really kind of dark, sad topic to our community, but I think if you are probably over the age of five, you've probably <laughs> experienced some form of betrayal. Well, I told my friend that I liked so-and-so, and I told them not to tell them, and then they told the whole classroom. Uh. Mommy, that hurts. Why would someone do that? Betrayal yeah. for a youngster. Mm -hmm. I told you something in confidence, and you shared it. So many of us have experienced betrayal from this age to whatever ageless beings that we are at this point. And we can carry those hurts with us. So are you denying? Are you burying, burying the betrayal? Are you marrying the betrayal? Or are you giving it to God? You have three choices. So many of us bury it. It didn't happen, I'm not gonna think about it. And when we bury it, we actually build walls to love. Divine love that is in us, we can't access. Love that's out in the world, everywhere present, we can't take in. Well-being, peace, love. So what's beautiful about Joseph's story, and I'll get to that, he didn't deny what his brothers did. There was never a denial that what you did intended for evil, God used for good. You intended to kill me. You ate as you contemplated destroying my life. And yet God turned it for good. So we don't deny what's been done to us. It's so easy in New Thought to do a spiritual bypass. We want to be so positive. So I'm contemplating this and I'm going, God, you really, you really want me to speak about this? It's not positive. It's not about positive or negative. It's about the truth. There are hurts that will happen on this planet as we embody, as we live in these bodies, spirits having a human ex experience, because people are coming from ego mind. And ego mind is dark. And some people will kill and maim and drop bombs and, and pillage <laughs> and destroy. So how do we as spiritual people come to terms with this? Know ye, who are you serving, God or mammon? God is all there is. 
God is all there is. God is all there is. And so, <laughs> Spirit said, and you're going to talk about that experience. I said, really? Do I have to share that one too? And so, my one of my deepest experiences of betrayal. It's fairly light, but it wasn't at the time for me. Um, and it's really, it's so funny. Until we come to a sense of worthiness and knowing who we are and whose we are, I think some of us will get a beat down. Because for me, it was that denial of my worth, of my light, of my talents, of my gifts, perpetually at a period in my life, during a period in my life, really got me beat up. So this betrayal uh, centers around my singing again. I was blessed, I had a cousin who I adored. I still adore her. Um, she was my, we were each other's favorite cousins. And because of my insecurity, I know that I kind of put her on a pedestal. Um, I tend to love to celebrate people, I still do, but now I see myself as a worthy child of God. At the time, I wasn't good enough. I was never good enough. So my cousin got the job um, singing. Uh, she auditioned against a thousand women, uh, singing back up with Celine Dion, going on the world tour. I have uh, cousins, I've, I'm Haitian descended, many of my family members live in Canada. So my cousin auditioned, she'd been singing at a jazz bar in Montreal. The music director for Celine came in, saw her and said, you should audition. She said, I remember at the time I was hanging out in Montreal like every other weekend. And she said, I know I'm not gonna get it, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Well, 1,000 women, 500 women, 300 women, 200, 100, 50, 10 people, three people, she got the job. Wow. And so when she got the job, I was there that weekend, and she, like we many, like many of us do, self sabotage I can't do it, I can't do it, oh my God, I can't do it, I'm not telling I'm like jumping off the bed like a crazy person. You gotta do it, you gotta do it, Celine Dion. So she goes on this tour, and when you're Celine Dion's backup singer, singing all over the world, Jobs don't just come to you. So she calls me up, she's like, I wanna be in Paris with you. There's a job during the Celine break um, with a singer uh, who I grew up with. I sang back up for a woman called Véronique Sanson. And Véronique is like a Elton John slash Carly Simon of France. She has 30 years of hits. Gachelle was going to do two weeks of the tour and go back on tour uh, with Celine. And I was going to do the nine month tour. So my so I am so I am working at as a hairstyling assistant. I'm, I've I've sung with bands in Boston, but I have never done a, wor a a world tour for this artist for an artist. So we're going to do all of France, all of Belgium, and all of Switzerland during all that time. And the average stadium is probably ten thousand to fifty thousand uh, viewers attendance. So um, I fly into Paris, treated like a queen, picked up in a limo, all of that, go to the hotel room, my cousin's there because we're both going to work. So um, the tour begins and they're like, what are your dietary requests, Martine? Do you like roses or daisies in your dressing room? And I'm like, I just like flowers. Thank you. And I was like, no, I hate daisies that, or, you know, lilies, they smell too much. My, my cousin, oh, no, I don't want this. I don't want that. Martine, what are your dietary requests? What do you eat? What don't you eat? I'm like, I'm just happy to be here to eat. <laughs> so, Martine, well, uh, what side of the hotel would you like your, your room to be on? I'm just glad to be at the Ritz Park. Sorry, I don't have a request on the side of the building. So, so as they're asking me, so I guess word spreads. She's really nice. She's really easy. And word spread. She's a diva. We can't, st oh my God. And everything's like, oh, this isn't Celine. Oh my God. Look at the quality of the food. Oh, look at these limos. These are, the, oh, like Celine's tour is unbelievable. So my cousin <laughs> is very critiquing. I'm like, who have you become? But I find myself, because I'm so grateful to just be in the room breathing, to be there, that um, we received per diem. So I, we were getting paid 3,000 bucks a week. 
with a hundred dollar per diem. So I literally put my paycheck in the work in the bank. Don't even spend it, and you get a hundred dollars a day. They've asked you to be on this tour. Why should you spend your own money? <laughs> so a hundred dollars a day, and during and with my hundred dollars, I have my little cash flow. But I'm always buying her lunch. I'm like, what do you want, my cousin? What do you, you know, what do you want? So I'm I'm spending all my money. She's not because I'm kind of bowing down to her. Do not make gods of others. But I'm bowing down to her because even though I'm there, I don't feel worthy. Even though I'm there, she's the better singer. Even though I'm there, um, I'm, uh, oh gosh, I forget the word, I never get, I'm, it's not, I feel like mm, this couldn't be me, that I'm faking it. And I'm not making imposter, imposter syndrome. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not faking it, making it. I'm an imposter. So time goes by. And my cousin seems to be getting meaner and meaner with me. Okay. And one day she says to me, why does everybody like you? And I thought to myself, because I don't make really a lot of comments about this like bazillion dollar tour being not, not being the Celine Dion tour. <laughs> you know, it's like we're staying at the Ritz, we're being driven around in limos, five star hotels, dinners and all that. This woman is a, is a huge star in the French speaking world. Globally, she's not Celine, but she's not like, you know, she's not sardines either, but you're making them feel like it's not the best. Okay, I think it's weird. She kind of yells that at me and we continue. We do the two weeks. I come back to Boston for a break. I'm so thrilled to see my mom and, and do all of that and to go back on the tour. So two weeks later, we're going to do all of France. I'll be gone for the eight months. During that two weeks, I call my cousin. Hey, sweetie, how are you? How's, I know that you're starting Celine, give me a call. And I call her, 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 and I call her. Maybe over a hundred times. She never responds to me. I call her aunt, my aunt by marriage, um, no response. I go back on tour. I'm calling my cousin. No response. Probably 200 times by this time. At this point, I'm hysterical. I'm sad. I don't know what's going on. I feel abandoned. I'm in shock. I don't know if she's dead or she's alive. You can't just call up the Celine Dion people and ask them for someone. No one's going to respond to you. Zero. No response. At that point, I'm one month into the eight-month tour. And once again, I'm grateful to be there, but I, I feel out of sorts because my cousin who got me on tour, and everyone loves me, has not communicated with me. So everybody's saying, so how's, how's she doing? How's Celine? How's the tour? I'm like, great, great. You know, I'm on the down low in the closet about the fact that I haven't heard from her. Intuitively, I go into prayer. And Spirit says to me, go speak to the singer, the person I'm working for, who's an amazing person. And you have to make meetings with celebrities even when you work with them. So her coordinator goes, okay, she can see you next week, Thursday at two o'clock, even though we sing on a stage together. So I have a, v a meeting with Veronique. And she sits me down and she goes, you're such a beautiful person. We are so thrilled to have you on the tour. And I go, thank you. I just wanted to tell you thank you. And she said, I have something to share with you. And I wasn't going to share with you, but it's so interesting that you decided to meet with me. And why are you meeting with me? And I said, I'm just in gratitude to be here. She said, you deserve to be here. And she said, your, your cousin is a very, very evil young woman. She said, um, she had told us that you had sung professionally all over the country. My cousin kind of made up a bio. I mean, I've been singing locally in Boston, but I hadn't sung globally. So she made up a bio and she said she came to, before she left to go on the Celine Dion tour, she came to Veronique and said, I lied about Martine. She's really not a professional. She's a two-bit singer. I think you guys should fire her. Um, I'm sorry that I even, you know, you're better off getting someone who's based in Paris who's a professional. I don't think she's up for it. And 
Veronique said to her, we like Martine, we're keeping her, she's a great singer. Now, I didn't know this went on behind my back. So she tells me this and I'm stunned. And I begin to cry. And she says to me, your cousin is very jealous of you. And I said, how could she be jealous of me? She's singing back up with Celine Dion on a world tour. What is there to be jealous of? She said, you're light, you're kind, you're charismatic, you're beautiful. She said, you're loving, and she's not those things. But I said, she has everything. She has everything I would ever want. Like, what? She said, doesn't matter. People will hate you because of your light. And she said, sweetie, I'm older than you. You'll get through it. And I said, I've been calling her maybe 300 phone calls. And she said, you'll get through it. She said, you probably won't hear from her. Well, little did I know that I wouldn't hear from my cousin who never spoke to me again for 15 years. Who basically tried getting me fired from a tour, who lied about me and put me down, who I loved. Oh, how I loved her. I adored her. She was everything to me. She was closer than my sister. I loved my sister, but I was closer to her. She was my heart, and she betrayed me. So for the first five, so about three years after the tour, there was a family wedding. She came to the state. She was living in Paris. So um, what was really interesting, because of my lack of prosperity consciousness, self-love, self-esteem, I came back, so let me finish my part of the story. I came back after the tour, I'm devastated by this. Eight months, no, no word of her. So I didn't know this was going to turn into 15 years. Eight months, I come back to the United States, betrayals, and I have a best friend. I come back after being on a tour. I'm so devastated by the loss of the relationship and, and the betrayal that I've decided not to sing again. I'm like, this singing thing is bad luck. That's what I, I said, this singing thing gets really funky and I'm, I'm not doing it. So I get back to Boston and I say this to a best friend. Now I've been on tour for eight months. I've been on TV. I actually flew a friend to France because I had so much money. I was like, come see me in Paris, I'll pay the ticket. And this friend knew of this friend coming because I wanted to fly both of them. I had collected so much cash in, in my bank account. This friend of mine says, yeah, I think it's more practical for you not to say. <gasps> what friend, if any of you had a friend who had just come off of a world tour as a singer, as an actor, as a famous, you would say, no, it's more practical. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't sing, you know. Focus on going back to the hairstylist, the nine to five. Don't pursue your dream. <laughs> don't, pursue, don't pursue your gifts and your talents. All of this, I'm sharing this story to tell, to, sh to, to reinforce what Joseph went through. Joseph was given away to a caravan of Arabs. He was brought to one of the chief administrators and leaders of the Pharaoh to the household of this man who saw that Joseph was with God. And what that means metaphor metaphysically is that Joseph was so anchored in knowing the presence of God that this man saw it. His vibration was so big, he was so attuned to the light of God that it was palpable that you could see it. My human mind experience and mistake was that I made a God out of my cousin. When she wasn't there to love me, to support me, I gave up singing, the gift that God gave me. When another person said, eh, I don't think it's practical, you shouldn't do that, just go back to hairdressing. And I was like, okay. Because <laughs> I had no sense of self, an idea of my worthiness and power because I wasn't anchored in God. 
when Joseph was heartbroken and, and betrayed by his brothers. That was a dark night of the soul. I wept and wept and wept and wept that I never heard from my cousin again, that she tried getting me fired, that she created, and it took a woman who was convicted who saw my light. But it was, it was an overfill of, okay, I have a good light, but I wasn't aligned. Joseph was aligned. He was with God. The chief officer of the Pharaoh saw that and made him the ruler or the director of the household. The director of everything in his home. He said he was so confident in Joseph's ability that he didn't think about anything except what he would eat. He trusted Joseph so much, being in charge, a slave in charge of his household. And his wife saw that Joseph was very handsome and cute and said, I want you to sleep with me. And he said, I can't do this to this man who's honored me. And so what did she do? She lied on Joseph and said that Joseph raped her, told her husband, who said, how could you have done this to me? Raped my wife in my own household. And Joseph was imprisoned for another eight to 10 years. Someone lied on him. Many times in our season of betrayal, it's not one betrayal, another one will come up. All of it a test, all of it reflections of consciousness. Who are you going to make a God of? The most high or what's happening? Are you going to have a fearless faith in the midst of your betrayal? that allows you to go on? Joseph did. He was honorable. He still did all of the work that he was supposed to do. And because he became known for being a revealer and an interpreter of dreams, the Pharaoh began having dreams that he could not interpret. And they went and found Joseph. They said that this man, this honorable man who is with God, we can feel it about him. He can interpret dreams. And so he interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh. And because of that, the Pharaoh so loved him that he became second in command of Egypt. Triumphed over betrayal. So when we anchor ourselves in God and we don't focus on what has been done to us, we don't bury it, because you don't want to bury it, bury it but we don't marry it i married it when my cousin did what she did for about 10 years my heart broke over and over and over again and i stopped singing if i had really trusted in god my heart would be broken i wouldn't deny the pain but i would have been anchored in who i am and used my voice anyway and used my talents and my gifts anyway but I married the betrayal instead of carrying it and giving it to God. Every single time I would have maybe felt anxious about singing, I would say, infinite one, you gave me this gift. I can't let what happened in, in France, in Europe, stop me. That would have been carrying it and giving it to the most high God. Of course, with spiritual allegories, the brothers eventually come to Egypt because there was a famine. Joseph has become so successful in the management of Egypt. Egypt represents materialism, the sense world, matter, God overcoming the material, the God mind, his alignment with God. He had mastery over the senses, materialism. And so in total, Joseph spent 22 years imprisoned. 22 is the master number of spiritual leadership. He became masterful in knowing God, in anchoring his faith in the Most High. And so he became a spiritual leader and second in command to the Pharaoh. His brothers show up. They don't realize it's Joseph at all. And Joseph eventually reveals himself. But what is so powerful is Joseph says, what you had done for evil, 
God used for good. What you have done for evil, to kill me, to eliminate me, God used for good. All of this to say in our betrayals, big or small, what was done to destroy me, to destroy my career as a singer, spirit intervened. This woman loved me. She didn't care. She was like, she's a beautiful singer. I don't care about her experience. I love who she is. And yet, because I wasn't anchored in God, I said, stop. This singing thing brings me bad luck. It's heartache and I won't do it. I married my betrayal. Thank goodness I know now that I can carry and give my, my betrayals to God and God will heal my heart. That is my message for you as we enter this new decade. Don't bury it in the basement, but don't marry it either. Give it to God so you can be free and you can embark on a fearless, faith-filled, joy-filled, prosperous, happy, new decade, new year, and a new you. And so it is. You guys know I love group affirmations because we're the one mind is it's power, 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 spiritual power. Is there enough? Is there enough? Oh yeah, but there's plenty. Oh, there's plenty. Yeah, there's plenty. There's plenty. They're coming. All right. Okay, they're coming around. My arm's getting tired. <laughs> There are two pages. There are two pages. I put a little star and tried my best next to I got the star. Okay, so we're saying the one prayer for release of grudges. Everybody let me know when you have a you have a copy. So there's a front and a back. And I put a little star next to the the front and the back. Prayer for release of grudges. Two pages. Two pages. Yep, and then paper. Grudges, I got an extra. So, anybody need these grudges? Okay. We'll take the extra. You'll take the extra? There is, is there an extra? No. No extra. Oh, one extra. Okay. Good. Perfect. This is just so important. These are little things that we can do. But it's real because there is one mind and one presence. And we can move into this new decade setting these intentions. So together and slowly. Dear infinite intelligence, I know in my heart it doesn't serve me to hold a grudge. Any negative thoughts or energy about a person or situation only makes that dark energy reflect back to me. My intellect knows it is not good to harbor resentful thoughts. I ask infinite intelligence to gently remind me that to harbor grudges is not in my best interest and to inspire me to forgive and release that story from my life. I choose to release the energy of injustice, of injustice and anger that I have been carrying around. I release victimhood and I forgive and release all concerned. I take responsibility in my life for being part of this drama, and I have the power to stop carrying this baggage around with me. Today, I declare my freedom.
freedom from this old burden of regret and grudges. I no longer have the responsibility of holding on to these grudges. I am grateful to let go and regain my spiritual integrity and understanding that we are all one. Souls are on different levels of consciousness, and it is my responsibility to be a light worker. I leave light, not dark, in the world. So be it. Thank you. Amen. And so it is. So it is. So it is. Oh. Mm.